Good afternoon and welcome to the January 11th, 2022 meeting of the State Board of Education. And this time I'm going to ask Chair Alex Stapleton if she will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd all please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We do have uh, several of our members who are online joining us today, so we do in fact have a quorum and I'm going to ask that all of the members in the room with us, as well as the ones joining us virtually, if you'll speak up good and loud so that the recording will pick up everyone's remarks this afternoon. Next item up is approval of the minutes for December the 14th. Is there any objection to approving the minutes as presented? Hearing none, the minutes are approved by unanimous consent. Next item is approval of the State Board of Education agenda for January 11th, 2022. Is there any objection to approving the agenda as presented? Hearing none, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. We do have some guests with us today that we'd like to welcome and some visitors. And uh, I'm going to attempt to read these names here. It looks like Lane Floyd, Scott Floyd, and James Floyd, Kathy Manus, and I'm going to struggle with this a little bit because the penmanship is about at my level, looks like here. Gene Niels, is it Strungja? Hope I got that right. And then Dr. Brandon Traxler, we're happy to have you with us today as well. And then we'll introduce a couple of other folks in the public comment section here in just a moment. Uh, we also would like to welcome everyone who's joining us online today to, uh, in this meeting. And thank you for your interest in the work of the State Board of Education. We did not have any news media folks that signed in today. Next item up is the state board chair report, but we've got so much on our plate already. We're just going to breeze right on by that. Welcome Superintendent Spearman back from her travels. I, I think she literally just got in from the airport a I little did. while ago. I did. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I was very honored uh, as president of CCSSO uh, to attend the college football playoff game last night. And I hope you all are watching it because they honored our state teachers of the year. Sarah Gams was there, our 2021 state teacher of the year, who is now an employee here and runs, works with our uh, department. Uh, the teachers have, were treated royally and were recognized as they should be for the great work that they're doing. And I thoroughly enjoyed being there and, and being with them. It's a real it's a lifetime memory uh, to get to go out on the field and, and stand with them. So it was, it was a wonderful experience. Today, for my report, I'm actually uh, being assisted by two very capable folks. The first uh, to come and give you a report on where we are with COVID uh, protocols in our schools, how testing is going, is Dr. Brennan Traxler, and I'll ask her to come forward. She is the Director of Public Health for the State of South Carolina through DHET. Dr. Traxler. Thank you, Superintendent Spearman, and uh, good, I guess it's good afternoon now, <laughs> Chairman uh, Walters and members of the board and, and guests. Uh, thank you all for having me today, though I wish that we were here to talk about a, a better and different topic. <laughs> um, as we go through, uh, I'm going to touch on three different uh, topics. First of all, just a brief overview of what COVID-19 looks like in our state right now, particularly with children. Um, the testing options that have been available and remain available to schools. And then um, the main focus will be on our updated a DHEC school and child care exclusion list, which came out Friday, um, and our school guidance booklet, which elaborates basically on the exclusion list, which came out uh, Sunday. So currently in South Carolina, as you can see from this graph, um, we are in, in a surge. We are seeing this Omicron surge happening in South Carolina. Um, there to the right, you can see um, those cases are the highest by a fair amount that we have seen in our states thus far. Um, while we are seeing increases in hospitalizations, I'm happy to report that it sounds um, at this point like 
Uh, it is not as severe of an illness for many people, certainly for those who are vaccinated. Um, so we are not seeing as sharp of an increase at this time with hospitalizations. Um, however, certainly um, the concern is that, that, that those blue lines and that green line continue to rise. Um, and then just based off of sheer volume, uh, we could end up with, with situations with our hospitals um, swamped with patients. Based on what we have seen in, um, in other countries where the Omicron surge is completed, this usually runs its course in about six to eight weeks in South Africa and the UK. No guarantee that will happen here, but we are certainly hopeful. Um, and so I have been telling folks just, you know, if we can get through January, hopefully February will be on the decline. Um, but that, again, remains to be seen. This is looking, just going back to this July, so this is looking this school year at um, cases in school-aged children in the state. And while you can see there to the right that we have seen an increase, you can see it's not as uh, sharp of an increase compared to that Delta surge, that other big hump, as you saw on the last slide with the overall case counts. And while we all are seeing children being infected um, and we are seeing more children hospitalized than, than we have before, Again, the severity, um, thankfully, is not correspondingly as high as, as the case counts. I will tell you also that while this looks impressive, the majority of our cases, we're seeing this driven by the 20 to 40, 20 to 50-year-olds, or where the majority of the cases with this surge are occurring. Um, the CDC uh, puts out uh, community transmissions, and they go down to the county level on their data tracker website. And this is, uh, as of this morning, they rank it by high, substantial, moderate, or low levels of community transmission based on an algorithm using the number of new cases and the percent positive for the last rolling seven days. As you can see, all of 46 counties in South Carolina are high. Um, the number that, uh, that isn't quite visible there uh, is that in the United States, there are only 24 counties that are not high. So out of 3,219 counties total. Um, so Omicron and this surge is, we are not alone in this. It is occurring nationwide. Looking at vaccination rates, um, looking at all who are eligible and everybody who is five years and older is now eligible for at least a primary series. And as of last week, all those who are 12 and older are eligible for a booster. So the, for the uh, primary series, Five and up, we are sitting just above 50% in the state who have done that, those first either two doses of Pfizer or Moderna or one dose of Janssen, and a little over 60% who have started, who have gotten at least one dose. The, ch the children, the five to 11 year olds, um, are not certainly as high. That has not been authorized for them nearly as long. Um, and it has been a little bit slower of an uptake. We did not see the initial rush that we saw for the adults. Um, However, that number um, does continue to increase um, at a slow but steady rate. Um, and so we are approaching 9% who have completed their primary series and are what we call fully vaccinated, and 14% who have gotten at least one dose. And we're only sitting about a month out, roughly, from when children, the first of those children even became eligible for their second dose based on timing. So the testing programs for schools, we've had three programs that we've made available to, uh, to schools throughout the state during this school year. Um, one of them actually went into place last year, and it is the rapid tests. We provide uh, the Abbott Binex Now antigen tests, um, similar to the ones you can buy over the counter if you can find them, um, but slightly different. Um, they come just packaged more economically, uh, you know, 50 to a box, et cetera. We provide those for school nurses for the school districts that want to participate in that. Um, we have 40 districts and then 13 charter schools who are utilizing those. Uh, and those are, again, 15 minutes. They're the rapid antigen tests. Uh, the Q uh, nucleic acid amplification test, which is similar to a PCR, is another roughly 20-minute test. Um, and we have a limited number of, of those, and those are currently in use by 19 private schools. 
The federal program that we um, have the ability to connect schools and school districts to, um, though we are not involved in the actual operation of it, is called Operation Extended Testing, or Operation ET. And at this time, we just are, have one charter school and one private school who are participating in that, though we are certainly always happy to, to connect others who are interested. And I'm afraid I don't know a lot of the ins and outs of that, again, because we don't manage it, but it is available. Uh, our other uh, very popular option is the turnkey testing vendors. And I will say there's 39 school districts and six charter schools that are using this. Some of those overlap with Binex. So some of them really are, are doing an outstanding job of testing and are utilizing both systems. Um, the turnkey testing vendors is a full service, basically start to finish PCR testing. Um, we have several vendors throughout the state. We pair them up then with the school or school district. They set up on um, designated dates and times. Um, I mean, it can be even, you know, every single day. And um, any and then students and staff that the school sends there can be tested certainly for free. And they are, they are doing, from what I am hearing, um, a pretty good job maintaining a 48-hour turnaround. Um, that they uh, have not been affected that I'm aware of by any of the recent um, backlog issues. But that is a 48, 24 to 48 hour turnaround on that test, but it is the gold standard test. Uh, I will tell you that as we go forward, the antigen tests, um, the Binex now, we are getting the maximum number that we can um, with, through a federal contract. And we're getting, we've been getting roughly about 20,000 a week, um, and those are for schools. So that is our top priority with those tests. Um, I don't know, you know, we, for many of these, we don't know what the um, supply chain looks like. Um, but we are committed to really making sure that to the fullest extent we can, we will provide schools with the testing materials that they need. Um, recognizing that antigen tests, rapid tests are very difficult to find uh, these days. But we are pursuing every avenue and, and um, lead that we're given. So, and again, we're, we're committed to prioritizing schools for this. So <laughs> the last couple of weeks have been um, <clears throat> busy when it comes to isolation and quarantine guidance. The, on uh, Monday, December 27th, the CDC around 5.30 that afternoon uh, announced a change in their overall isolation and quarantine guidance for the public. This is one week before schools in South Carolina were to start uh, resuming in person. And, um, and so we scrambled and, and worked very hard over the next week. Um, the CDC was not certain when they would be providing updated K-12 school-specific guidance. And we knew from what we were hearing from, from schools that they needed um, updated guidance for return to school. So we did update our school exclusion list that um, that Friday, New Year's Eve, actually. Um, and then subsequently, a few days later, our guidance. In typical uh, irony, two days after we updated our big, thick guidance booklet, uh, the CDC came out with their new K-12 guidance. <laughs> um, but so um, we just went back and, and reviewed theirs and reviewed the data and science behind theirs um, and compared it to ours. And a lot, number of our um, medical epidemiologists were involved in it, as well as some of our experts in schools, um, school-specific coordination. And so we then published on Friday an updated, again, exclusion list, and on Sunday an updated guidance booklet. The school exclusion list is, is kind of the high level what's required for isolation and quarantine. The guidance booklet goes into a lot more detail and more kind of scenarios. It just elaborates. It's meant to augment, really, the exclusion list. They don't oppose each other. So for isolation, and I want to make a point that for both isolation and quarantine, it's gotten easier. It's gotten more relaxed. So that's certainly a good thing, and it's based on science and data. Like I said, we looked at it and made sure that we were comfortable that this was safe to do. Uh, for isolation, previously, if you tested positive, you were isolated for 10 days from when your symptoms began, or if you never developed symptoms for when your test was performed. And you had to, at the end of that 10 days, not having fever for 24 hours without taking fever-reducing meds, and your symptoms had to be improving significantly or improved. 
The new isolation um, requirements, which are based on the fact that Omicron has a shorter incubation period and it looks like a shorter infectious period, uh, are down to five days. So you have to isolate for five instead of 10. Um, again, no fever for those last 24 hours. Your symptoms have to be significantly improving. And uh, the, one, the one kind of part of the deal, I guess you would say, is because there may be a few people who are still slightly contagious at the end of that five days is that everybody needs to wear a mask when they come back for the next five days. So it, instead of really taking away five days, it just converted those last five to in-person but masked. Um, and you do not have to have a negative test to come back. The CDC has changed their guidance for the general public again and um, made it optional. We're certainly never going to tell anybody they can't, <laughs> um, but it is not necessary for return. So for quarantine, and I want to point out that all of these options um, assume that the person has no symptoms. If they have symptoms, they need to stay out until they can get tested and such. Previously, there were three options. A full quarantine was 14 days, um, didn't require a test. There were two, for this school year, two um, options to shorten that were in place. One was 10 days without a test. Um, and the other was seven days, as long as you tested negative on day five or later. Um, so that was really the shortest you could shorten quarantine to was for, for seven days if you were a close contact. Now, a full quarantine is down to 10 days from 14. Um, we left 10 days as, uh, without a test as an option. We did clarify in our recent update that we intend this really for schools when they're in very significant cases, um, really that's substantial or high, especially if they're seeing transmission potentially in the school. Um, and this gives them more ability to, to really try to break those chains of transmission. Um, and we're, we intend for it to be used temporarily in those kinds of situations. The kind of new normal, <laughs> if you wanna say, quarantine is five days, um, but you do need to test negative on day four or later. Um, and you need to wear a mask then for those days six to 10. But you can be in person just wearing a mask. Um, it is important for that testing on day four or later, especially with children, because I have, I can tell you, I have anecdotally heard from friends who are pediatricians already just this week of um, identifying in two situations um, an asymptomatic kid who was getting that day four or five test. But they were positive. So that really, that's what makes it safe, that and the mask wearing, to come back in as short as five days. The other option, which the CDC released um, data from two pilot programs they did back in mid-December, is a test to stay program. And that eliminates the need to quarantine for really for anyone, for anybody who would otherwise be needing to quarantine. But you have to have two negative tests within seven days. Um, and you do need to wear a mask for that whole 10 days that you would have otherwise potentially been quarantined. But this would have the ability then to keep anybody in person in school. However, of course, a rate limiting step is having the rapid test availability and having uh, staffing to perform them. And we'll get to that in a minute because we are accepting now home tests. People who can avoid quarantine altogether are if they are vaccinated so if you're 18 years or older, if you've gotten that primary series, and then if you're eligible for it, a booster, we know that the booster gives significantly more protection for Omicron. Um, for many of the students, if they are five to 17, they just need to be fully vaccinated. Um, only a very few uh, really, I guess 12 to 15 year olds are even eligible for a booster. So, um, I guess all 12 to 15 year olds now, my apologies, but, but those are the only ones. And we still strongly encourage it for those 12 to 15, but they do not have to have it to avoid quarantine. If they have a documented infection with a, a PCR or antigen test, not an antibody, to know exactly when they were infected within the last 90 days, we can assume they have some protection still and they do not have to quarantine. But both of these folks would need to of course, have no symptoms, and then they do need to wear that mask for 10 days. 
Our other guidance, kind of the, the big highlights, I would say for the two big highlights for the updates. Um, in the past, we certainly left it to the discretion of schools as to whether accept the at-home, over-the-counter rapid test results. But we did discourage it out of concern for the validity of results, people performing them correctly. Um, at this time now, with really more and more of a push towards rapid tests, um, and especially using them to shorten quarantines and eliminate the need for quarantine. We um, agreed to, to certainly encourage schools to accept those, but we did say that they needed to get an attestation form. Um, we provided, you yeah, know, the template, the provided one for them in our guidance booklet. It basically just says, yes, I performed the test on this person. This is the brand test. This is the number that was on the box. It was positive or negative. Here's the date and time I did it and sign it. Um, and so then they can accept those um, as hopefully they become more and more available to the public. Classroom outbreaks, again, previously, and this was previously was the CDC definition, it was three or more cases anytime during a two week period within a classroom. As you can imagine with Omicron, as easily as it can be spread, um, we would have had what would be classified as an outbreak in many classrooms. And so um, we decided, and the CDC seems to have departed from that, um, but have not provided a new definition. So um, we determined that we would adopt basically our flu type definition. And so 20% or more of a class absent at any one time with COVID would be considered an outbreak. Um, and so that's in that situation, certainly our local epidemiologists work with the schools to determine what what steps need to be taken with the class, but um, potentially unvaccinated students, they might want to have stay home for several days to again, break that chain of transmission in the classroom. But um, we certainly made that more, um, more reasonable and based on the, the science with flu. So <clears throat> again, this is from the CDC, but it, I thought it was simple, but very true. We know we have the tools to fight Omicron. That's testing is what's hiding over there on the right. Um, masks, so for testing, first of all, like I said, we are committed to doing everything we can to really prioritize schools and get them the testing that they need. Masks, we know, especially with Omicron, that they're important. Plain cloth masks, just cotton masks, are probably not as effective against Omicron as they were against Delta and others. They recommend that you either pair those with a disposable one or use like a KN95 like I have on. Um, but again, I tell folks, any mask is better than no mask. You will get some protection from even a cloth cotton one. Um, it may just not be the maximum amount, but it is certainly better than the no mask that'll give you no protection. And then the vaccines and again, the booster, if you're eligible, are the best way to protect yourself. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well, you're at the right place for some questions. I know I've got a few, and uh, you, you've become very adept at having to uh, do this. And first of all, thank you for being here. Before I get to my questions, though, I do want to open the floor for our other members and give you uh, the first opportunity to, if you have any questions for Dr. Traxler. All right, I'll jump right in then. So, and... Uh, I'm a safety director for a school district, so I'm, I feel your pain. I'm right there with you on a lot of these things. Thank you for what you do. And uh, so some of the questions that have come up in, in, in our decision-making process, how we implement the guidelines and stuff, uh, the first one, let's, let's start with the uh, home test. That's optional for districts as to whether they wish to accept them or not. Is that correct? It is optional, but as we see more and more of the emphasis and the availability of testing shifting to that direction, to the at-home rapid tests, we encourage them to, um, to start adopting those, again, using the attestation form, but it is optional. And you say now that the, the rapid tests are available, that you can ship them to schools for use. Is that right? Uh, yes, I mean, we don't have an absolutely unlimited supply, oh, I but, yeah. I <laughs> but, guess. but yes, sir, yeah. um, we've been getting, you know, as I said, about 20,000 a week of the Binax now, um, have been using here recently, especially pretty much right at that, but have not um, had our demands at this time exceed yeah. 
that availability. And I know some districts are, were excited by that, but uh, some of the ones are using the vendors, while well, you know, th there's still a turnaround time involved, right. and so the, the option of a rapid test. But then the concern that they voiced to me is, is that having it, if you, if you could send it home with them, they can do it and have it proctored at home, but if it's done in the school, the nurse has to do it. Is that right? Correct. And so um, we are, the ones, the Binax now that we have made available are the ones that have to be proctored by a nurse and such. Right. They come 50 to a box and one bottle of, I call it liquid gold, the, the solution uh -huh. that you need to do each test. So it's just one bottle for 50 tests. Um, we are in the process of um, procuring and have procured and if the weather will clear up west of here, we'll be shipping to us any day um, some at-home rapid tests. We are finalizing our distribution plan for that and some more point-of-care tests that we've purchased. Mm -hmm. But again, especially for schools um, where it is going to be um, more of a struggle, they don't have a full-time nurse, that sort of thing, we will be working with them as needed. The rest of these um, at-home tests, the vast majority will be going out into the community anyway. Okay. So, but that would be a possibility, so like you say, especially for the ones that don't have nurses, is that they could be distributed through schools. Correct. Okay, that, that came up from, from several nurses. Um, another question that came up was on the, and I choke on trying to say this word, attestation form. I have to say it very slowly. Uh, apparently, there's two tests involved in the home test kit. But it the, looks like there's only one block on the form? They only have to perform one for each time that we say one test is needed. Okay. Correct. Many of the tests, if you were to go buy it over the counter, would right. be two to a box mm -hmm. for, for really maximizing the accuracy of the results, especially if you don't have symptoms, it's best to do two. Certainly to the extent people have, the, have access to two, I encourage them to follow the instructions mm -hmm. on the box. But at a time where testing demands are... At unprecedented levels, um, we will accept one. Okay. I know some of the nurses say that some families, because of the shortage, will buy one kit and test two kids with it. And so. as long as they're not doing that test to stay where it is two tests required, right? It, that is acceptable. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. That's good clarification. The next one was uh, maximally vaccinated versus fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And the, the question that came up there from, uh, this came from our nurses in particular, is that with the 12-year-olds and up now being eligible, but it's not required that they be maximally at the moment, is there a possibility that could change anytime soon? So we don't get into where we've told people they can stay and now next week we've got to send them home. I do not anticipate it um, changing, understanding that this is an ever-evolving um, mm -hmm. pandemic, but as I noted, really those, um, especially the, the 12 to 15 who, the first of them just hit the five month time frame needed even about a month ago. <clears throat> so most of them are not even eligible anyway, even if they're fully vaccinated. Um, they're just, or they're just now becoming eligible. The CDC, we align with the CDC in that guidance. Um, and so barring um, some unexpected new data coming out, you know, I, w I don't anticipate here in the near future that changing, no, sir. Okay. And then um, is it any thought or consideration going to – I've heard a lot of people talking about what's happening in Georgia where they're pretty much saying if you're asymptomatic, just go to school, go to work. Uh, uh, no, sir. Um, <laughs> if you're asymptomatic, you still can spread the virus. Um, I will tell you it is not only the acute infection that concerns me um, – but the long-term consequences and what we don't know about those, especially in a, a child who is still, you know, physically developing, their brain is still developing, um, we still want to, to do everything we can to, to limit transmission, um, but also certainly do, are trying to safely relax things as much as possible to keep kids in school. Okay. Anybody else have any questions now that you've had a moment to think about it? And I tell you, we, I know we all spend a lot of time going through the uh, materials that you send out and, and doing this very carefully and uh, also trying to make sure that our parents understand. And so a lot of these questions I've just asked you are the ones that we're getting. So I want to thank you for taking the time to answer those and hopefully through this forum today uh, be able to give some answers out there that will help clarify some of this for some folks. 
Certainly, and thank you all for the sharing of messages that you all do. It's greatly appreciated. Okay. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trax. So we appreciate your dedicated work. All the folks over at DHEC, I, we have have enjoyed working with you, uh, and it's been a long, almost now two years, but you have made yourself so available to us, and we know that we're learning as, as we go, and we appreciate um, your willingness to always come and give us good information. For the second part of my report today, um, I would like to call on Dr. John Payne for a very, very special recognition. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, Madam Superintendent. Today, as part of Superintendent Spearman's update, we have a sp uh, special presentation to make in memory of Dr. Susan Weathers Floyd, a previous and long-term, a long-time employee of the South Carolina Department of Education who passed away back in October. Her husband, Dr. Lane Floyd, himself with a lifetime of service to public education, as well as their sons, Dr. James Floyd and Dr. Scott Floyd, are joining us here today. In, early, in the early 2000s, we began two projects aimed at reducing the shortages of special education teachers and providers in our public schools through our SC Create uh, program, as well as through a separate Project SLP, Speech Language Pathologist, Recruitment and Retention in Schools. Susan Floyd, in her tenure here, in concert with leadership from the speech-language pathology programs at U of SC and South Carolina State University, created Project SLP, which, like its SC Create counterpart, provides scholarship opportunities uh, for public school employees to obtain a master's degree in speech-language pathology to address the critical shortages uh, and shortfalls of these important providers. Today, we are also joined by Dr. Jean Neal Strunhaus, who is the center director and faculty for our Project SLP at program at U of SC. This program is now in its 14th year, and our latest numbers show that we have 13 people currently pursuing their master's degree in speech-language pathology, 57 additional ones that have applied, and as of today, we have over 68 individuals who have completed their master's degree in speech-language pathology and are serving in and representing most of our school districts in South Carolina. Dr. Susan Floyd was originally from Orangeburg, South Carolina, and she earned her master's and doctoral degrees from U of SC. She served the, city of Lakes, uh, served the children of Lake City and Florence III for over 30 years and uh, to culminate her career served here as Ed Associate for Speech Language Disabilities at the department. Dr. Floyd gave presentations, consultations, workshops, and publications not only in South Carolina but throughout the nation and presented in and to 37 states during her tenure. She served as the American Speech and Hearing Legislative Counselor for South Carolina and was very active in that organization. In fact, in 2001, she earned the Roland J. Van Haddam Award presented by the American Speech Language Hearing Foundation as the top speech clinician for the entire nation. She was also awarded the ASHA Clinical Achievement Award in 2001 and the DiCarlo Award for Clinical Achievement in 1992. I had the privilege of working with Susan when I first came to the department a number of years ago now and learned so much from her, namely her passion for working for and on behalf of students with disabilities to protect their rights and elevate their voices. In 2013, our project SLP was incorporated into our larger SC Create program, but our project SLP continues to provide school districts an opportunity to address any shortages of speech language pathologist. The progress we have seen in South Carolina would not have been possible without the vision and the cathedral building that Susan undertook in starting Project SLP. So today we come before you as we name, as we rename our SLP scholarship program as the Dr. Susan Weathers Floyd Speech Language Pathology Scholarship Program in memory of Susan. 
As part of that, we would like to present her husband and family a plaque that commemorates this memorial and dedication. And I would simply ask if they could join me here now at the front. The plaque reads, the, the State Board of Education and the South Carolina Department of Education on this 11th day of January 2022 hereby establishes the Dr. Susan Weather Floyd Scholarship Fund in memory of Susan Weathers Floyd for her passionate dedication and outstanding leadership as State Coordinator of Speech Language Pathology and Assistive Technology, development of the SLP preparation component of the Centers for the Re Re-education and Advancement of Teachers in Special Education and Related Service Personnel Program, and a Lifetime of Distinguished Service, signed by State Superintendent Spearman and Chairman Alan Walters. Alan, why don't you... And Dr. Floyd, on behalf of all of us at the Department of Education, our public school districts, and our South Carolina students, we thank you for your wife, her commitment to education, her commitment to students with disability, and the difference her life made and continues to make in public education in South Carolina. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and, and what an outstanding legacy that that will serve, uh, having that bear her name going forward. I'm very happy that that will take place. Our next item is parliamentarian comments. Just one comment. Don't forget your ethics statements. If you didn't say that, <laughs> I was going to, because I knew that was going to be coming. Ms. Hazelwood would be very disappointed if we didn't talk about that in the January meeting. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. We do have some public comments today, and signed up first is Kathy Manus with the Palmetto State Teachers Association. And of course, as all public speakers know, we appreciate your interest and your allotted five minutes for your comments, and uh, typically we don't respond to public comments. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Kathy Manus, the Executive Director of Palmetto State Teachers Association, and I'm here today to say thank you. Uh, Governor McMaster has proclaimed January as School Board Recognition Month, and uh, I'd like to read just a part of his proclamation in case you haven't seen it yet. It starts as, whereas education is the foundation of which the economic, intellectual, and social capital of our state is built, and where school boards, including our state school board, directly influences instruction in South Carolina's public school, and how the decision of our school boards affect the present and future lives of children while setting the direction to prepare all students to be competitive in a local, state, national, and global 21st century knowledge. Whereas School Board Recognition Month highlights the unique role school boards play in representing the constituents by promoting and advocating the quality of public education. So, Governor McMaster proclaimed January 2022 as School Board Recognition Month throughout the state and encourages all South Carolinians to recognize the contributions that school boards make to the academic success of public school students across the Palmetto State. And I just want to thank you for your service that you have here as our State School Board of Education. PSTA would like to thank you for what you do every day for the students, teachers, and parents in our South Carolina schools. So thank you for your service, 
Sometimes you're not thanked enough for what you do, but that's why I'm here today representing Palmetto State Teachers Association to thank you for what you do every day for our students in South Carolina. And I have a little gift that I left for you, and those of you who are watching on the screen, I'll leave yours here for you. So thank you, and thank you for what you do. Thank you very much. And now Sherry East with the South Carolina Education Association. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon um, for allowing uh, me a few moments of your time to speak with you. And I am following in Kathy Manis' footsteps in that it is January is School Board Appreciation Month. And the, I am a um, high school science teacher. My name is Sherry East. And I'm currently serving as the South Carolina Education Association president. And we are here today to say thank you for your service on the school board at a state level and to all the other school board members out there that may watch this later. Thank you. Um, it's been a rough couple of years <laughs> to be a school board member or to be anyone in education um, right now. So I made you a folder of certain things, but I always try to give you some little bit of advice or teach you something as we're learning. So if you want to follow along, I have a Marigold story. So I'm going to um, try to take a story that we use with our first year teachers and adapt it to your role as the school board. And so this story is in there and it's called Find Your Marigold, the one essential rule for new teachers or new board members or anyone really. So it says, welcome to your first years of COVID. These years will test you more intensely than anything you've done up until now. It can deplete your energy, bring you to tears, and make you question every talent or skill you thought you had. All these tests, if you approach them the right way, could leave us better and stronger than you are today. So advice is everywhere, as we have heard and solicited um, from everyone telling us how to do our jobs. So our advice to you today is to surround yourself with good people. Find the positive, supportive, energetic people in your life and stick to them. You can improve your job satisfaction more than any other strategy by finding these positive people. So this is called the marigold effect. And I don't know if anyone here is a gardener, or master gardener, if you've ever tried to plant anything. There's something called companion planting. And then here's a pack of marigold seeds for you. So marigolds are one of those great plants that if you plant other things near them, they will help your, your garden grow. They repel bugs and they pre, um, prevent fungal disease. Um, the marigold is the best. It will protect your plants against pests and harmful weeds. So um, when I was working on my master's, we went to an organic farm and they were planting cucumbers, but every so many feet they would plant marigolds. I'm like, why are you doing this? Like, you're planting cucumbers. You're trying to, to, grow, to make a profit, but you're planting flowers. And they're like, oh, these marigolds, they keep out the, um, the beetles, the cucumber beetles. So then I started working on it. So you can plant marigolds around your porch. They'll keep off all kinds of things. So marigolds, not only in your garden, but exist in your life as well. They are the people that support you and nurture you and help you grow. So in your life, I'm going to ask you to find a marigold or be a marigold to someone. And the other thing when you're gardening are walnut trees. So if anyone's ever planted a garden, you'll know you can't really plant vegetables under a walnut tree because walnut trees give off a toxic um, substance in their roots and it'll kill all your vegetables. So just like in your gardening, in your life, there are walnuts. These are the people that are toxic to you. They're always bringing you down. They make you feel insecure, discouraged, overwhelmed, or sometimes embarrassed. You don't want to ask them questions. So we're, my advice to you is to avoid your walnuts. And then your walnuts can be working in your life. Um, your coworker could be a walnut, your administrator, your your partner, your wife or husband could be a walnut, and you have to learn how to um, maneuver around the walnuts. In the story, it gives you a lot of examples of different kinds of walnuts that are in your life, and I'll let you read through that. But um, the main goal or the, the purpose here is to just remind you to search for your marigolds, be a marigold, but remember that the walnuts their toxicity comes from a place of real pain or real problems that they've had. So try to be nice to the walnuts or, or um, at least understand where they're coming from. So as you go through your life and make decisions for our children in South Carolina, um, please remember to 
find yourself some walnuts, um, not some walnuts, um, some marigolds and to be a marigold and try to surround yourself with all the positive vibes you can as you make these decisions for our children in South Carolina. So that is it for me, and uh, have a nice rest of your month. Thank you very much. And so now we'll move on to our state board items. The first is our policy and legislative committee report. Uh, this committee met this morning, and we had three action items. Uh, we had one for online testing and testing window extension waiver requests, one for approval of property disposal in Greenwood School District 50, and approval for best practices and model policy for library materials and reconsideration of the Library Media Center materials form. And all of those uh, were passed and were placed on the consent agenda for today. We also had an information item on school district waiver request updates. And now the next would be the Educator Professions Committee report. All right. Madam Chair-elect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the committee this morning, we approved eight action items, and I know the board members, you have those items in your materials, but they included the critical needs geographic areas list, five new educator program recommendations, national accreditation decisions, and a request um, for an out-of-country clinical experience placement. The committee did approve those items, and we did place all of the action items on today's consent agenda. We also heard one information item, and that was the PRC, Educator Preparation Provider and Program Updates. Okay. And your action items, I believe, also were placed on the consent they agenda. They were all placed on the consent agenda, yes. Very good. The Standards Learning and Accountability Committee did not meet today. Uh, however, the Educator Licensure Committee did meet today. Ms. Chapman, you have a report for us? Yes. Um, we dealt with 10 cases this morning, eight suspensions, and two revocations, and those cases were ratified in the full board meeting. Okay, thank you very much. And as you said, the full board uh, did not have any cases today, but we did, in fact, ratify the uh, report of the Educator Licensure Committee with those cases. So all of those items otherwise were placed on the consent agenda, and is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. And the motion carries. So now we will move into our reports. Dr. Mathis is going to start us off with a literacy update. Well, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman and school board members. Today, I want to give you a, an update. Um, while it is, does impact literacy, I think it impacts all of our um, real uh, content areas. Um, and just to let you know how um, in the College and Career Readiness Division, we're prioritizing our work to help districts. So our division of the College and Career Readiness Division is making every effort that we have to maximize the potential um, that we have of helping districts um, deepen student learning. Um, and as everyone across the state is working diligently to um, address unfinished learning that's been impacted by COVID, um, the division wants to make certain that we are strategically focused um, and that we're meaningfully helping districts. And so our directors um, in our division for the last couple of months have determined that we need to work a little bit smarter. Um, there's so many things that we can have on the plate, but we want the things on the plate that make the difference. Uh, we want to do what works, um, but more than that, we want to do what works best. And so we have div um, um, identified two priorities in, in the handout I gave you identifies those priorities that our division, seven offices, are really going to focus on. Um, and this does really have its greatest impact on unfinished learning. And priority one is that we assist districts with a cohesive system, assessment system, of formative, interim, and summative assessments that effectively assess our content standards. 
What we really want to do is take the guesswork out of what is going to be in the preparation for the summit of assessment. We want to prepare students, make sure we prepare students all throughout the year um, for that state summit of um, assessment. The second priority is that we develop um, a robust resources in our state learning object repository that will provide all teachers in the state, and particularly those in underserved areas, with the tools they need to effectively deliver instruction. I think one of the things that we have noticed during the pandemic is throughout the state, we have a resource gap. Some, some districts have far um, more resources than others, but we want to make sure the resources that we provide all of our teachers align strategically and um, that they provide robust instruction and rigor um, necessary to meet the academic standards. And so we shared these priorities with our, our state, um, the district, um, throughout the state with our district instructional leaders, and we asked them for their feedback. And um, the division further defined our scope of work after we received that um, information, again, to stay focused on what matters the most and what, how we can best deliver um, our help from the department. Um, and the, um, I think it's the third um, page over, you will see how we plan to um, align our focus. And it's very simple. We cannot remediate ourselves to, to better stu student performance. We have got to strengthen tier one, core one instruction that every student gets in the state. And for those students who need extra help with that unfinished learning, then we need to provide the interventions for them. But clearly, to deepen student learning, we need to strengthen tier one core instruction that every student gets um, in the state. And so how can we do that? Um, we're going to do that by um, making sure that our all of our schools um, understand the effectiveness of MTSS, which is the multi-tiered system of support in core instruction, what that looks like in every class, every day for every student. Um, we want to make sure that teachers understand their content and they understand the depth of the standard. And um, Chrissy, you probably know oftentimes teachers look at those standards and they ask, what am I supposed to do here? Because it is, it is, it is, oftentimes difficult to understand. So how can we structure our help to make sure they understand the depth of that standard? And then once you do that, that you teach and assess day in and day out to the level of where that standard, the depth of that standard. Because if you don't, you're not providing the, the most effective instruction. And then we want to make sure that, that uh, teachers understand the evidence that they need to accept from students that the student has, has mastered that skill. And as we look at the standards, we understand there are certain standards that emerge through the year. We understand that there are certain standards that are going to spiral and come back again um, later in the year and in the years to, the, that may follow. But there are some standards that we call the jumping off point. Those are the ones you must know before you go the next grade. And helping teachers understand and administrators understand what those, where those standards um, fit. For those students who need interventions, we want to make sure that, again, they understand the multi-tiered system of support and what's expected for those students who need um, a level of intervention support. And as they do that, the interventions must, need, must meet the individual needs of the student. It's not a cookie cutter approach for interventions. Everybody doesn't need the same thing. But what do the individual students need and how do you personalize that? One of the most important time of the, times of the day are for those students who need, the, for those students who need help with interventions, the planning that goes into those interventions is some of the most important time, times of the day. So we make sure that those are planned um, effectively. But if an intervention isn't working, we want to give teachers the ability to recognize that and then refocus for, for other help. And then the third area that we want to um, align our focus on is those curricula and resources that, that teachers need. Um, 
and there again in our learning object repository, making sure that it is loaded for all teachers with the most um, robust standards, I mean robust materials that address our standards. We realize that all districts don't need the same help, um, and we're positioned to help districts personalize that with what um, they may need. The, uh, just to give you an example of where we are with um, how we want to help districts, you've heard us talk about, I mean, mentioned in meetings past, that book, Annual Growth for All Students and Catch Up Growth for Those Who Are Behind. And we realize that every student has to make annual growth, but those who are behind have to make um, annual growth. And the author of the book um, gives this sobering um, quote. And you take, for example, a primary student who's just come to school out of kindergarten and may be behind. That means for those students, she says, they must make one year of annual growth and one year of catch-up growth for each year. And if they're behind, another way to say that is by year three, um, there has to be two years worth of growth in first grade and second grade and third grade. That's the sobering reality of where we need to help our districts. Um, and, um, but we can do this. And so our, I just wanted to give you that update that that's gonna be the focus as we go out. How do we help with that tier one instruction for all districts or for all students? And then how do we focus on the interventions that matter the most? I'll take any questions. Questions for Dr. Mathis? Don't think we have any. Thank you very much. And now we have our three district reports for Allendale, Florence District 4, and Williamsburg District. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am not Kim Mack. Um, Kim is no, out today, so I'm going to give her updates, and I think Superintendent Spearman is going to have a few comments, too. Uh, with respect to Allendale County School District, on December 3rd, Allendale County Schools hosted a monthly COVID-19 vaccination clinic at Allendale Fairfax High School Gym that was open to students, staff, and the Allendale community. 97% of the Allendale County School District employees are fully vaccinated, and 35% of the students are fully vaccinated. The, de the district has seen a decrease in the COVID-19 positive cases and quarantine cases since securing on-site weekly testing in September 2021 with Rapid Reliable Testing, LLC. In terms of Florence 4, Timminsville seniors and juniors at Timminsville High School participated in a lunch and learn with college recruiters. A Marine recruiter uh, presented the benefits of a career in the armed forces. Uh, one Timminsville High School student scored an 83 on the ASVAB and another scored 52. The district uh, collaborated with the Farah Turner Foundation Fallen Officer from Florence County to provide three families within the Timminsville community to receive donated Christmas toys, clothing, and other necessities. In Williamsburg, three teachers at Anderson Primary and two teachers at King Street Middle School Magnet School have received an SEC Bright Ideas grant to fund classroom project and activities. Student teachers in the USC Elementary Teaching Program visited Hemingway Elementary to learn about the advantages of teaching in a rural community. And lastly, a local industry, Palmetto Synthetics, hired four local high school students as apprentices. And those are the updates that I had, but I will defer now to the state superintendent. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Payne. Uh, good afternoon. I did want to give you some information um, in our three districts as we're moving now into January of 2022. Uh, I have held a meeting and have one plan that we've already met with the Williamsburg County Board of Education um, to talk with them about the transition from state management back to local control. Uh, when we went into uh, Williamsburg a few years ago, the primary deficiency there was out of, they were out of compliance with special ed programming and other federal programs. There were other issues audit issues, um, lack of teaching on standard. So 
on standards. I'm happy to say that now the district is in compliance. They, they have been able to manage all special uh, education programming. There are two cases that are ongoing because the amount of services need to be provided over a certain amount of time, but the district is doing that well and we are working with them. They submitted an on-time clear audit. We have given tremendous amounts of professional development there, and it is time for us to begin transitioning out. So the agreement with the board, and this is going out to their board chair in writing, but we have met in a verbal agreement that over the next few months they will begin uh, training, having some training provided for the board members. Several of them are new to the board by the South Carolina School Boards Association. We will discuss and work with them as we develop the budget for the 2022-23 year with them. It will be our final decision, but we certainly want to give them that practice of going through how to build a good budget, as well as other decisions that they will begin making. And I have told them if all goes well, we plan to complete that transition sometime near the end of this year, or definitely by January of 2023. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled with the Allendale County Board. Um, Dr. Wilder, of course, in Williamsburg has done a wonderful job. Dr. Gilmore in Allendale. Similar situation there. The stability of the district with administrative personnel, amount of personal, uh, professional development for the teachers and staff to make sure that they're teaching on standards, rigorous standards, uh, rigorous curriculum for the student, uh, as well as reports being on time. We're very, very satisfied with the way the the district has progressed and it's time there also to begin talking about a transition and my anticipation is that it will follow a very similar timeline if all goes well as we work together during the spring summer and beginning of next fall that the state will be able to um, lift the emergency declaration in Allendale as well. Timmonsville 4. Uh, I have met with the chair of the Florence One Board and I have sent a letter to the board members. They will be meeting on Thursday night of this week. And I've asked the, the Florence One Board to begin immediately the preparation that they need to complete the consolidation of Florence Four in with Florence One by June 30th of 2022, just a few months from now. The immediate things that need to happen uh, are that they begin meeting with parents and students because the Timmonsville High School will be closed, as will Johnson Middle School. So the middle school students and high school students will select classes from any school in Florence District 1. The board will vote on this Thursday night, but we anticipate that they will continue to offer choice for all the Timmonsville students to select the school that best fits their need and their family, and of course the students need to register for classes. Brockington Elementary will remain open and serve the children of Timmonsville. It will also become an enhanced school for the arts, a magnet school, and will be a choice school that other families in Florence One may select to send their children to Brockington Elementary. So I'm very excited about the expansion that may happen there at Brockington Elementary. I've asked Florence One Board and their superintendent, I'll ask the board to allow Dr. Richard O'Malley to become the designated superintendent of Florence Four, as I would work with him during the next few months. He will be reporting to me, working with me and uh, our folks here at the agency for all of these activities that would um, need to take place. And then, of course, he would become the superintendent um, should their board continue on with him in, in the leadership there in Florence One uh, on July 1. Um, I have asked the board to please give priority to all the teachers and staff members of Johnsonville Middle and or Johnson Middle and 
of Timmonsville High School as vacancies are open in Florence One. With the teacher shortage that we have, I feel comfortable that those teachers will be able to be placed, hopefully in Florence One, if there are not enough positions open, I have committed to them that I will contact surrounding superintendents. I cannot guarantee everyone a job, but I can promise them that I will do my best to let it be known that they are available and uh, that they can find a match uh, so that they can stay in the teaching force. So um, those are a lot of details that are going on. There will be a lot of action happening. Uh, this news that you're hearing uh, is being discussed this afternoon with the Timmonsville um, staff. And I'm sure, you know, we'll be in the press shortly and we'll be uh, discussed at the board meeting Thursday night in Florence. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the superintendent or for Dr. Ping? I want to thank everyone, uh, Ms. Kim Mack, who is, uh, leads our Office of School Tran Transformation, spends an awful lot of time, our coaches, our, all of the staff who have worked so hard, but particularly the teachers and staff, students, in these schools uh, who have worked so hard with us and made significant progress over the last few years. These decisions have been um, made in, and I have um, thought about this for a long time and really the decision is made in the best interest that I feel of the students. Change is difficult and I know that um, it's difficult for our community when a school is closed but with the declining enrollment that we have seen and the very, very small enrollment when you start with it and then a declining enrollment, it becomes very difficult financially to operate a district. It becomes very diff difficult to find the teachers to have the programming that these students deserve. And I believe that these changes will be in the best interest of the students and also of the community that these students will receive uh, a better array of not only academic opportunities, but also extracurricular activities. So it's made with a, with a heavy heart, but I believe it's the right thing. Well, Sir. Thank you for your leadership with dealing with all of these issues, the right decision. Certainly it's not an easy decision, but I think in the long run, we're gonna find out it, was definitely in the best interest of the students, the staff, the parents, and everybody involved. So thank you for that. In other business, I think the only thing they have, do we have travel forms? So check with Tracy on, on the way out for those, uh, unless anybody has any other business to come before the board. Hearing none, we will stand adjourned. Thank you very much.